Well, good morning to each of you. Uh, greetings in Jesus' name. And my subject for this morning is on prophecy and tongues. And in my devotional reading, and I end up sharing with the family uh, a verse from 1 Corinthians 14.20, which we're going to go there um, and read that together. But I just was struck by that Paul was encouraging them to study and mature in their, their usage and knowledge of spiritual gifts, maybe even these supernatural gifts a bit. And so it kind of got me thinking, I had been talking in the Ten Commandments, but it got me thinking on prophecy, tongues, miracles, and demons. And this morning I'm just planning on talking about, uh, speaking of demons, I'm talking about casting out demons, knowing uh, when someone is demon-possessed, just learning to discern these things. So that miracles and demons are going to be for another time, but prophecy and tongues for today. And so I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. And it says, Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. I'm going to go on to the next verse. It is written in the Scriptures, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So, He is there saying He, he wants them to be mature in these things. And yet, I think sometimes there's a temptation to try to figure out study evil just so we know what is wrong. I think primarily we need to be as servants of God need to have a heart. A heart that seeks to do God's will. The problem with studying what is wrong is it will often open ourselves up to things that we don't want to be opened up to. to spiritual powers that are not good. The Scriptures don't teach us to do that. Is it Galatians? I have it somewhere. Galatians it talks about whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so that is the tenor Paul is saying here. Be innocent as children or babies regarding the evil. It says babies. But on these things, he encouraged them to study and become mature. Not just to, to do tongues and, and babble, without a reason. He wants them to know why. I think a couple a couple things about maturity is that you will often know the end reason why. Why does God even have tongues? What is the purpose of it? Because if you know the purpose for it, you're far more likely to wield it correctly or to use the spiritual gift correctly. So we're going to study that a little bit. But I will make another comment here. This Corinthian church, there was two letters written to the church at Corinth. And they this book is really a, a book of rebuke as much as anything. Encouragement, rebuke. But he was not commending them for their use of tongues in many things. I mean, they are selfishness at the communion table, sexual immorality, divisions. They're wise in their own eyes following particular human leaders instead of God, the headship order, both in the home and church not realizing Christ is the head, not Paul and Paulus or certain people they felt like they, they were following. Um, they were they get taking out lawsuits against each other as believers instead of accepting injustice and loving, returning good for evil. They were not sharing in his needs, which he was glad to do. But again, they were selfish in not thinking about him. Uh, chaos and competition in public worship. And they also had some false teaching of no resurrection. And Paul's like, we have no hope. Some of you are teaching that there's no resurrection. If we have no resurrection, there's no hope. So why are you teaching wrongly this is not what the scriptures teach so 
the church at Corinth was needing some adjustment of not only their doctrine, but their heart condition. Because all these things come from the heart. They, they said they loved God, and yet they were struggling fairly carnally. And so let's keep that in mind as we study about what Paul is teaching them about prophecy and tongues. So maturity is understanding the, the purpose, perhaps, maybe the ability to perform and use. But 1 Corinthians 12, verses 29 to 30 says that not all have these things. I will read a couple of verses quick there. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. So maturity does not mean, maturity and understanding does not mean that we'll be able to do all these things. But understanding the purpose that God has even given those gifts to the church, because He has, will help us to sort the good from the bad. I thought of uh, 1 Kings 3, verses 9, where Solomon prayed for an understanding heart. 1 Kings 3, 9, Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? And I say, for us as God's people, as His servants, we need an, an understanding heart. Why these things are even necessary. Um, so we know how to either use or re realize if it's a wolf in sheep, a, sh a wolf that is wearing sheep's clothing. Like, what is a false prophet? What uh, are all, is every person that comes and says they are speaking in tongues? Are they all good? Well, Paul was not happy with how they were doing it. Now, the FBI, when they train to identify counterfeit money, they don't train on counterfeit money. They train on real money. And then they they can quickly tell what is wrong. And so there's a lot of danger in going and studying things outside of the Word of God to try to... I mean, other religions even, for example, I think there's some danger in that. If you're going to get outside of the Word of God, you're, you're really playing with fire. So... I would like to read our text, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 33. It's a little longer text, but it's a little hard just to pick out a little here and there. So we're going to go 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 1, up to 33. Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy, for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching that will be helpful, even lifeless instruments like the flute or harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the so soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. 
If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. There are many different languages in the world, and every language has meaning. But if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. And the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me, and the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have the special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So, anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I am saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. It is written in the Scriptures, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking in an unknown language, they will think you are crazy. But if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring, God is truly here among you. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, One will speak in tongues, another will interpret what is said, but everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present, who can interpret? They must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, and another person receives a revelation from the Lord. The one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. So, what exactly is prophecy. We have a little idea of prophecy, and there seems to be a bit of a change in what prophecy and prophets in the Old Testament did between the Old and the New Covenant. Um, There's some similarities, but in the Old Testament there was more of thus saith the Lord type prophecies where God spoke through the prophets, inspired the Word of God, and also pronounced that such things were going to happen. Um, That is not exactly how Paul describes it. I find it interesting that there was prophets through... God led His people through prophets, but at Jesus' time, when Jesus set up the, the coming of the kingdom of heaven, He set up disciples and apostles and other people, a more distributed uh, prophecies, maybe. Joel 2.28 talks about, about him pouring out dreams and visions, or young men seeing dreams and visions, and I'll probably reference that later. But I wonder if this isn't a little change from what we think of as Old Testament prophecy, and yet I don't think it's strictly just teaching Scriptures. I think it's more than just comforting and encouraging. It is referenced many times through this passage we just read. Strengthen, comfort, encourage, challenge. 
when they see prophecy, they see the Word of God, they see the presence of God in our midst, the unbelievers, it says it's primarily for what? For the believers. Prophecy is for the believers. The Scriptures are also primarily for who? For the believers. Yes, unbelievers might be convinced of their sin and believe, but, I mean, the unbelievers aren't required to obey the Word of God in this life, but they will be accountable by it. It's the same. So prophecy, very similar. similarly, is for the believers primarily, but when unbelievers see it, they will hopefully be convicted of their sin and worship God and say, God is truly in their midst. <clears throat> so, we've talked about a few of the things that are obviously important about prophecy. Um, I've uh, gone th over a couple of my notes. As servants of God, I think prophesying... You cannot prophesy well. You cannot lead songs well, teach Sunday school well, without spending time with God, without having your personal devotions, without listening for the still small voice. This has happened many, many times in my experience and in other people's experiences that I know of, that as a song leader or as picking a topic or some, something... Things just all line up. And I know the Scriptures mesh so well. But God leads. He provides and He gives direction. But I know a number of times when I had felt a strong leading to lead a certain song, a Christmas song, in the middle of early August, and I was told that the preacher said, well, I was going to ask you to lead that song that Sunday. And I, I know of at least five type situations like that that I felt so compelled, a quiet sensing. But I think this is part of the work of prophecy when maybe God even speaks through us, gives us a song, gives us a word of encouragement um, that we maybe hadn't thought of before and we can share it. And... I think a lot of times, just even sensing when you're going about your day's work and you sense that you should call someone. Is that a little bit of the work, the work of the prophet? Comforting, caring, um, the Spirit of God, servants of God. Maybe that's one of the different gifts, but what I'm saying is there's some supernatural direction that God gives us as we use the Word and as we use our mission to strengthen, comfort, encourage, and challenge the believers and perhaps even the unbelievers. So prophecy is not the Word alone, but I think it's the living Word. It's, it's what, when we have the Spirit of God in our hearts, helps us to apply it where we don't even even realize no i've never been like jesus where jesus prophesied to nathaniel that hey i saw you under the tree but god has has given me direction before So, in Joel 2, 28-29, your young men, where are we here? Joel 2, 28-29, Then after doing all those things, I will pour out My Spirit upon all people, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will will see visions. In those days I will pour out My Spirit even on servants, men and women alike. And so it's not just about dreams and visions, but also prophesying. 
And so back then, it seems that in the Old Covenant, this was a little more poured out on like an Elijah, uh, the prophet of God. Whereas Joel is prophesying that in this time, your all people are going to prophesy in this way. They're also going to have dreams and visions. And do dreams and visions happen? Yes, they do. There's, I'm sure we all have dreams that aren't Bible inspired, spirit inspired dreams. But you know, there's one that I've mentioned before that I know of a fellow, Daniel Pollard's wife up in New York City. And they'd had the church van stolen there and they couldn't find it for several days. And then she had a vision at night of where to go find it. And she knew exactly where it was. And so the next day, they went down there to that exact spot and got the van. So God does give prophecies, dreams, visions, and directions more through the whole body of Christ as we are tuned into His Spirit and as we have need. I think we should be careful of any prophecy, no matter the form, that doesn't comfort, strengthen, encourage, or challenge by the Word of God. Um, in my study, and I had listened a little bit to a couple different teachers, and John Piper was one of them that I listened to a video on. And he talked about, he was teaching about prophecies and tongues, and he said that some lady said so she had a prophecy for him that his they were expecting a baby and that his wife was going to die and she was going to have a daughter. And he was like, well, well thank you. But he didn't tell anybody. Uh, didn't tell his wife about that. Does that prophecy fit into the comfort, strengthen, and encourage or challenged by the Word of God. Um, and I'm not sure it did And when his wife did not die and they had a boy. He said he, he always let out a whoop, but he said this one was an extra, extra loud whoop. Um, so I think as we judge the spirits, as we judge what is good and what is not good prophecy, understand the purpose of it to start with. God is keeping His people. He wants a church that is strengthened, comforted, comforted, encouraged, and challenged. So, I think I missed a chair in a couple verses. Um, 2 Peter one twenty one talks about prophecy. And I think it's really... Um, good. It says, or from human initiative, no, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. And I think I like that one in a different translation, the regular King James Version better. Um, but basically, men don't speak from their own, prophets never spoke from their own initiative, but of God. So, for a person to just speak without God actually leading them, even now I believe it's the same the same way. It's God speaking through us. Also, Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, watch for false prophets. I'm going to go to that. It's Jesus talking. I'm not going to be able to quote it very well. Matthew 7, 15. The title at the heading of this little uh, section is The Tree and Its Fruit. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
Um, verse 20, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And I may add, not just if they do tongues. or There's some churches that they put a high priority on saying, well, if you don't do tongues, then you don't have the Spirit of God. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later. I don't believe that's what he's teaching. The tongues are not superior to the fruit of the Spirit. For a lot of these churches where there's this made up babbling, is it better to make up and be dishonest about it? Is that, you know what the Bible says about dishonesty? That's not going to be good for them. And so these gifts never supersede the fruits of the Spirit and good character, is what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Where am I here? 1 Thessalonians 5. Closing out on the prophecy. So be careful of any prophecy. What it is, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-22. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies. But test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. So, in the Old Testament, yes, even in Deuteronomy, they were told to test the prophets. But the New Testament, there is even a a stronger testing the prophets, whether it is true, whether it lines up with Scripture. And... Many false teachers come. And when false teachers come and they have a new revelation, or they have a new prophecy, or they have an angel appeared to them, and they have a new book, and they have a new whatever it is. No, we're not in the age of new revelations like that. We are not. Yes, yes, we are learning to understand the scriptures. More things will be revealed to us, but not through additional. Scriptures. And so, what they say better line up with the actions, their fruit. Jesus, Matthew, uh, was it 5, 17, 7, 15, I think it was. So their actions better line up fully with the whole Scriptures. We need to, to watch out for that. This is not the age of the prophet that comes in to say, well, I'm the person you should follow because God has appointed me to be that person. Okay. Moving on to tongues. So tongues were given as a confirmation of God's plan, approval, a sign perhaps. You know, in John 20:29 20, Uh, John 20, verse 29. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen Me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing Me. So, I need to give you a little more context so you understand why I brought that verse in. I think when the Pentecost was... The Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. So there was tongues of fire and there was tongues of understanding languages. There was supernatural proof. Jesus said, I will do what? I will send another comforter. Jesus did not leave us without some supernatural proof. Even for Himself. There was four things that Jesus said proved who He was. He says, anybody that comes Himself and say, well, I am this, you can't believe them. But Jesus said, John the Baptist gave proof of himself of Jesus, prophesied to him. Jesus said his teachings and his miracles also proved his authority. He also said that God himself at the baptism, remember the dove, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the fourth thing Jesus referenced was the scripture. There's four things, or four and a half or five, four things that that gave witness that he wasn't just 
fool of himself from just leaving the supernatural things. And so, I think, you know, as we believe, Jesus gave us a confirmation then when the Spirit came of the power of the Spirit and it's actual that it actually happened and that it still happens. But Jesus said about Himself, so you, you have seen Me and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen or will not see and believe. I don't believe miracles are necessary to happen to each person for us to believe. The Scriptures say there's enough the story of Lazarus and the rich man, there's enough in the Old Testament to believe. And so, do we have to see tongues to believe the Scriptures? No, we don't need to see tongues to believe the Scriptures. And I know people who know people that have actually had, like, secondhand in Romania where the Scriptures were preached and people in another language understood tongues. I'm not saying they don't happen. But I feel like we don't have as much need of the confirmation of God's power when we know. If we're not willing to use study the Scriptures ourselves, if we're not willing to use Google Translate, if we're not willing to go into all the world, if we're not willing to love our neighbor, God sometimes waits until we're ready to put things into action or until there's an actual need until miraculous sorts of things start to happen. <clears throat> so there's a few different kinds of tongues. There are tongues in an intelligible language, a foreign language where people understand. There's unintelligible babblings that the Scriptures say must be interpreted, at least in the public setting. And then there's a few verses that that do acknowledge the maybe even the inaudible groanings of the spirit. And I think of the song Tears Are a Language That God Understands. I think God I don't think that's just a made up song. I believe God understands our hearts and what our heart is saying even in great distress and whether it's in weeping or in silence, or perhaps even in babbling sounds, God understands where our heart's at either way. So there are a few different kinds of that. But I think one of the important things that we should remember about tongues, the tongues were useful for God to communicate with His people in every situation that I can... So whether it was them understanding the language, the Scripture being preached, God was able to communicate with His people. Or whether it's Him hearing our groanings, or there's some interpretation given. If His people are not understanding or hearing what God is saying to these tongues, I wonder if the true purpose of the tongues is actually being fulfilled. So, I'm going to be talking a little bit about miracles and demons, but I think I referenced this a little bit already, but there is some desperation needed for receiving a miracle. You know, how many people that did God heal, Jesus heal, who just were sitting back, huh, show us something pretty exciting. No, the people He healed were, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Or they had spent all their wages that they had, like all their income and visited, all the, they had already exhausted all the things that they could do. And then they saw Jesus and they, and they, they were desperate. They wanted it. Those, I think so often we have too many dollars in our bank accounts, too many other options that we haven't exhausted yet. I think once we exhaust and we show our commitment to the situation, God is more likely to 
miraculously help. Some say that God's people will do tongues, but 1 Corinthians 12, 29-30. Did I reference that already? I do not remember if I did or not. Basically, do all have the gift of apostles? I think I already referenced that. Do all have it? They don't. And so this idea that everyone must show the ability to babble and roll on the floor and I don't know what else. I've actually not been in a situation like that. That is not something that is taught here in the Scriptures, even in kind of the core passage, that the core book that talks about tongues. So, let's be careful that we covet the best gifts, he says prophecy, all the gifts that we want to talk with God, that we want God's message, His communication with His people to be open. all to the strengthening of the body. And, again, none of these supernatural gifts are greater than the fruits of the Spirit. To make something up and be dishonest about it is, uh, again, very counter-spiritual. If you're not being... And they may feel that this was a elevated sense of, I'm not sure, I don't know. I just think we need to be careful that all these things encourage, strengthen, build the body, this communication with God and His people. I find it interesting, of the four supernatural gifts that I plan on talking about, prophecy, tongues, miracles, healing, and uh, casting out demons, Jesus actually did three of them. He did the miracles, the healing, the prophecy, and the casting out demons. But there's no record of Jesus speaking in tongues unless His groaning and praying in the garden is somewhat of a communication with the Father. Um, So perhaps that. But I thought also... Jesus was sent to who? Matthew 15.24 says He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they all would have understood His language. That's who He was primarily sent to. And He told the disciples, greater works are you going to do than this because you're going to be sent out into all the world, first in Judea, and then on out into all the world. And there was provision for people to understand. You know, languages, tongues were miraculously confounded at the Tower of Babel. If God can miraculously confuse languages, He can also miraculously unite languages. And what language will we speak in heaven? Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't God tell us which language we're supposed to be studying so we can speak in heaven? Um, It's evolved quite a lot from year to year, much less from century to century. I'm glad he didn't say which language we were supposed to study because we would be studying that language. I think the language is in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. Understanding the heart of God. And I I was taken aback by a comment I heard the other day. Uh, A young man was talking about his grandfather, Merv Marchand. Um, He said, he talked so much Pennsylvania Dutch growing up, he said it wasn't until about 15 years ago that he started to think in English. It's like he's been with English people most of his life, but his childhood and everything was all Pennsylvania Dutch. And so we even think in a language. You think about that. You think in a language. And how is all of that united? And the reason God understands everything is because He understands even our heart's intents. He understands everything behind every word. And 
at that time, He will give us, when in heaven, I believe we will all have the same language, the, the same ability to, to understand and be understood. Now is the time of He wants us to be focusing on learning languages to find the lost sheep. Going into all the world, which may involve um, Spanish or Chinese or something else. So that's the stage we're at. These are gifts that should be prayed for. We need to be careful, though, of, of displays of gifts that draw attention to the doer. They're not for the doer's glory. They are for the strengthening, the upbuilding of the body of Christ, for the glory of Christ. John 14, 6, in closing. Jesus talks about sending the Holy Spirit. Um, talks about sending a comforter. says, I want to prepare a place for you. I don't think this is quite the verse that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the... Okay, verse 16 probably. Verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him. But you know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. So, this Holy Spirit, also known as the Comforter or the Advocate, is working in these gifts of prophecy and tongues and each of us. So there's kind of like fruits of the Spirit and then there's spiritual gifts, which is kind of like each, each of us has a job to do in the body. This morning's message was not really about the spiritual gifts like of teaching and of table making or, or whatever the spiritual gift is. Uh, this was a little more about supernatural type stuff. But each of us should be doing something. We won't all have the gifts of tongues or perhaps even prophecy. But I might say we probably all. Paul said, I wish you all had the gift of prophecy. I'd li like you to have that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the Holy Spirit the Comforter, the inspiration of the Word of God, but also as You speak to our hearts in the still small voice that You lead us in Your ways. You know, as we, as we mess up, there's such a peace in knowing that You'll tell us where we need to get back on the straight and narrow. Help us to walk obedient. And help us to love You, love others more than ourselves, to build up and strengthen and comfort and challenge um, the body of Christ to love the things that you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.